Okay, we're, we're still going to be on prophesying. You know, it's amazing. I thought that message was going to be one week, and it's now turned into four. Um, because so few people understand it. Um, and we know that prophesy, when Paul says prophecy, and he says don't despise prophesying, you know, the word prophecy means to, uh, of course, it's inspired speech, but it also means to enlarge, or to um, not enlarge, but to, it talks about the future. It's something that's coming in the future. So when Paul was writing about don't despise prophesying, he wasn't talking about the prophesying that mostly goes on today of where, and I'm, and I'm not criticizing what goes on today when I say this. I am, but I'm not, because I think there's too much of it. But he wasn't talking about when people call you up for a word and they prophesy to you about the great ministry you're going to have, the, 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 uh, uh, who you're going to marry, who you're gonna, you know, what God's going to do in your life, and how prosperous you're going to be. You're going to be a millionaire. Paul wasn't talking about that. Paul was talking about the prophesying of the future of our lives in this book. The future of what God had, was saying that hadn't been seen on the earth before because it's real easy to despise or think lightly of when you hear of the impossible things that God has for His church. We read, you know, I've said this before, but we read impossible stories in the Bible and church people have no problem believing it as long as it's history or as long as it's future. If you try to preach the impossible to them in the present, that's where we get into trouble. Is you're trying to preach impossible things to them in the present life. Because in our present life, that's where we get affected. And if you don't change your present life, all the promises of the future won't come to pass. And it's amazing how we reach a place in church where we plateau out in our belief system or in Jesus being Lord... And that's where we stay the rest of our lives. Because most of what's going on in church isn't prophesying, it's mostly exhortation and comfort. Prophesying is for edification. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. fourteen, verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1. Familiar with most of us that are in the charismatic word of faith Pentecostal move. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially what? That you may what? Notice it doesn't say it, but especially that you might do miracles, or that you might do healings, or that you might give words of wisdom or knowledge. It says, especially that you might prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks what? Edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So prophesying is for all three of those, but most of what goes on in today's church, if you listen to uh, most of the preaching that goes on, most of it is exhortation and comfort. They're telling you what God's going to do in the future, and they're reading to you what God has done in the past. But they're not telling you they're not edifying you. How many of you remember what edification means? What does edification mean? It's what? Yeah, it means to enlarge, right? It means to make bigger. It means to enlarge. And so we automatically think, well, God's going to come down and enlarge us so that we can make, get more stuff in of Him while leaving everything else there that's not supposed to be there. But that's not what edification means. Edification means to enlarge by removing something out and then placing something back in. How many of you have ever taken furniture out of a room? What's the first thing you say? Man, this room's big. <laughs> you just edified the room because you took everything out of it. We've got a great Old Testament illustration in here where when a good king or when a bad king would rule over Israel, what would he do to the temple? He, no, when a bad king. When a bad king ruled over he he would... He would bring all kinds of idols in, asterisk poles, prostitution booths, altars from other countries. They would build. and he'd put, Then when a good king would come in, what would he do? He'd remove all of that. Once he'd cut them down and he'd remove the prostitution booths. And he'd try to put things back in the way that it was the order that God had originally intended. What, what's that good king doing? He's edifying the temple. What's our good king trying to do? He's trying to edify our temple. He's trying to remove that which is bad so that more of him can move in. It's amazing to me, you know, we read about increase all the time. Uh, we read of the increase of his what? Government, there shall be no end. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be changed from glory into glory. 
You know, everything here points to an increase in the church. And it really bothers me that whenever I go places and whenever I see people, they've plateaued out, and you can go there in 10 years, and they're still exactly where they were before. There's supposed to be an increase in us. There's supposed to be an increase in our passion, in our love, in our singing. You know, I, I, you can go to a church in 10 years, and they're still standing there singing. They may put a hand up like that. You know, after 10, you've been in there 10 years, you ought to be showing some strength towards God. You ought to be showing some emotion, some passion towards Him as an increase. And I know what somebody's going to say. They're going to tell me, well, uh, we've gone over this time and time and again. Well, I'm just not that way. I'm quiet and I'm reserved. Well, good. You get to repent. You get to operate in a fundamental Bible principle. You get to repent and change from your way to God's way. See, I'm prophesying. I'm getting into your, I'm, chain, I'm wanting to change your present life so that, so that the future, the promise of the, the future promises that are in here can start to come to pass in our lives. And you think about it a minute. If, if you listen to a lot of people when they preach, they're always telling you what God is going to do. What he's going to do in the future. He's going to do this. He's going to, you know, he's, and you listen to them prophesying, they're constantly talking about what God's going to do in the future. But he's not going to do any of that unless you change your present. If you don't change your present, all that future is just a movie theater mentality. You know what a movie theater mentality is? Yeah, you get to live it through somebody else. You go to watch the movie and pretend you're the hero or the heroine, you know, shooting and the love interest and whatever it is. You pretend that while you're watching the movie. But you really wouldn't want to run across the courtyard with five guys shooting at you with machine guns. You don't really want to experience that. But you like to watch it and pretend you're that guy. And I think there's a lot of people in church that sit there and they pretend they want all these promises to come to pass, but they're going to have to be the guy running across the courtyard getting shot at in order for them to come to pass. And they don't really want that. They just like to watch it and hear about it and amen it and then go home and live our American lifestyle. And so when you start prophesying to change your present, see, that's when you get into trouble. Remember Paul said about Demas? He said, Demas has departed or has left me having loved what? This present world. Why is that word in there? That's always, why would he say, why not just say having loved the world? It's because Demas loved his present life. Because that's what needs to be affected is our present lifestyle. And it has to be ever increasingly interfered with. I was thinking this week as I was going to minister this message. Think about Paul, Peter, James, and John, the prophets. Think if they were Americans today. What would their families be saying to them? People come into this church or other churches like this, and the first thing their family does, you're getting involved in a cult. Paul lost everything he had. He said, I've lost everything. He was a Pharisee. That means he had money, he was, had power, he had influence, he was well-known, he was well-respected. All of that was gone. And Peter, James, and, and John had a business, a lucrative business on their own. They walked away and left it. Now, can you imagine today in America, with, if those guys were alive today? See, we love to read that because it's past and it doesn't interfere with our present life. But then when we start preaching that things like that could happen, what's going to happen? People call you a cult, and if you even start to do it, all of a sudden, family members that you haven't heard from in 10 years, all of a sudden are on the phone. Friends that you've never heard of, since you graduated high school, are now calling you. Is that true? That's the persecution we're talking about at the beginning of the service. Is God's going to be asking of our lives, and He's going to be asking us to believe, and, to, and when I say believe, not just in your head, your actions are going to show what you believe. Impossible things. Impossible things that don't line up with American culture. I shared last week that we are a cult. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> what? Cult simply means one leader. See, most people think it means false religion. 
It's not, 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 it's not, it can be, but it just means one leader. Rome called Christianity a cult because Rome had so many gods, like America and like most churches that we talked about this morning. You know, we have so many gods now that our kids, our middle school, junior high, high school, have to take drugs to deal with all the gods that have been forced on them from Rome. That's what they have to do. Let me ask you a question. Do you think anger has increased in the earth? Do you think uh, lust has increased in the earth? How about fear? Do you think that's increased in the earth? You know, it's amazing. The church will sit on its hands and look at all of this, agree with what I just said, and yet I try to get God to increase in their life, and I've got a fight on my hands. I, kind of, I try to get the increase of God's government in people's lives, and now I've got an argument. Now I've got a fight. Kids are having to deal with th gods now that you and I never even heard of when we were, when we were kids. Gender fluidity, they're teaching five and six-year-olds. Gay lifestyle, all the different sexual lifestyles, four years old. That's why we've got to have so much, so much mind-altering medicine is because even adults can't handle those gods. Kids definitely can't handle them. And so we've got the exact same situation going on today. We're trying to preach one God, one leader. I'm not the leader. I lead this church, but I'm not the leader. God is one leader. He's the leader. He's it. He's the man. In all things, he is to have the supremacy. In all things, In all things he is to have the supremacy. So according to that word, the definition of that word, we are a cult because we have one leader, and that's God. And most of the Christians that I know or most of the church people I know, and even in myself, you know, most of us, when we walk out of here, we have gods trying to influence, even when we're sitting here. How many of you have the God of hunger start to affect you as you sit here? If I start talking about food, all of a sudden there's an increase. You see where I'm coming from with this? And so prophecy is very, very important. It's for edification. And uh, we learned last week that Jesus made this statement on the cross, and it's something that people have to understand. They have to grasp this, is that, that when Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do, he was speaking to the Romans who were casting lots for his clothes at the base of the cross. Because, and I, I wanted to bring this up uh, today because last week somebody may have gotten the impression, I don't know if any of you did, but somebody might have, is that I was saying that Judas, um, they, had, they had already had forgiveness preached to them. I wasn't saying that Judas or the Sanhedrin or the Jews did not have forgiveness or couldn't get forgiven. What I'm saying is they had already had it preached to them. Rome hadn't. You've got to remember, they didn't have the Internet. Phones, bookstores, Bibles, everything, most everything ha that, that, that spread from the time of the book of Acts had to be by verbal words. They didn't have the New Testament either, by the way. So it had to be spread by words. So Rome, the Gentiles, needed a preacher. So when he said, forgive them for they know not what they do, what is forgiveness? We always have a tendency to think Jesus is saying, oh, forget what they're doing because they don't know what they're doing. Just forget that sin. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is speaking what we have preached so many times here about binding and loosing. He's loosing the ability of somebody to go to Rome to preach. And notice Paul's a Roman. It opened the door for Jesus to speak to Paul on the road to Damascus and say, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So you never know what you're loosing in the atmosphere with your words, one way or the other, good or bad. Words have power. And so what you loose can change somebody's life. I mean, we read, most people have read that and they don't have any idea what that means. 
But that loosed forgiveness to be preached to the Romans by a Roman in Rome. Forgiveness is not forget what I've done. When you ask for forgiveness, you're asking God to speak to you, to edify you, and remove the sin out of you. Not just for God to forget about what you've done. And go on your merry way. How many times has that been ministered and preached? That God, how many of you have heard this statement? Forgive and forget. You know where they got that? They got that from the false concept of forgiveness in the Bible. Are you telling me God remembers all our sins? No. But He remembers them if you don't actually walk or allow Him to forgive you the way His definition is. Think about it. Say you've got somebody in your church that's coming to church to be set free of pedophilia. You going to let him teach your kids? Oh, no, wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to forgive and forget. If you've forgiven him, then you have to forget that, right? No. It's if he's allowing God to speak into his life, and that means God himself, God through the Bible, or God through any of us. When you ask for forgiveness of sins, what you're doing is you're asking God to speak to you and to, to, run, to rule your life. We've made it into a forgive me, I get to go to heaven, now I can go live my American lifestyle. How false is that? It has nothing to do with going to heaven. It has to do with being cleaned up here. Heaven will be an automatic. I'm not taking heaven out of the deal. But heaven will be an automatic if you let God deal with your present life here. It was never about heaven. It was about getting victory over sin in this life. And, oh, well, we just can't do that. Then you would have never believed any of these impossible stories of the Bible. You'd have never helped Noah. You'd have never believed in the virgin birth. You'd have never been part of Gideon's army. <laughs> you would have never believed David was king. You would have never believed Jesus was the Messiah. And all the other impossible stories that were in here. We can get set free of sin, but it's going to take us changing our present life for the rest of our lives. And if we don't make it, I'm not saying we're going to make it. I'm just saying if we don't, we hand the baton off to a younger generation that may, or they may hand it off to another generation. But somebody's going to get there. By allowing Jesus to be Lord. How many times does Lord appear in this Bible, Kathy? was 7,000 some odd times. And how many times does Savior appear? I think you told me it was 76. What is the emphasis in America? Savior. That's all he's ever preached is Savior. I know you've heard this statement. He's your Savior. Now you need to make him Lord. <laughs> you can't do that. If he's not Lord, he can't be Savior. That's why he's always called Lord and Savior. It's never the other way. It's never Savior and Lord. It's always Lord and Savior. He has to be Lord first. You have to desire him to be Lord. Then he now can become your Savior. Turn with me to, uh, let's see, Romans. Funny that this is in Romans as well. Um, I'm not sure which one I want to go to first. I think I'll go to Romans 4 first. And this isn't the one that's funny in Romans. Okay? It's the next one. Romans chapter 4. See, normally I don't have a handheld mic. I've got an earpiece. So this kind of ties me up. <laughs> I guess I, I should welcome all our internet viewers, shouldn't I? <laughs> welcome everybody. Hello, Terry, if you're watching, and Mordecai. I guess, what, he's coming. He's coming. Danielle, when is Mordecai coming? June, we can teach him some more proper English. <laughs> I hope he's watching. I hope he's watching. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. I just want to read in chapter 4, verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now notice forgiven comes after covered. Or covered comes after forgiven, I'm sorry. Uh, Forgiven comes before covered. And so what you're doing is whenever you ask, even if you ask a person to forgive you, like if I was to ask Kathy to forgive you, my, my responsibility is, is that when Kathy speaks into my life, the things of God, or what, a God correction, or a God uh, uh, exhortation, or word of comfort, my vow is, I will listen to that and obey. It's not all on God's side. It's on our side, just as much. God has to be the one to speak to us when we ask for forgiveness, but we've making the vow, we'll listen, and we will obey and change. Yeah, forgiveness doesn't mean you're sorry either. It means you recognize, and see, that's why it says, blessed are the ones whose sins are forgiven. It's because we recognize sin in our life, and so we run to God. And we say, forgive us of that, and that way God can now cleanse us, not only of the unrighteousness, but also begin to work on us to eradicate that sin out of our life. See, I'm prophesying to you right now present things. There's enough prophesying out there about the promises of what God is going to do that you can listen to out there. And once in a while, I'll minister on those things. But I recognize that if we don't change our present lifestyle, we just got, we're just coming in here and listening to a movie. And what happens is, is that as people get older, they begin, to lose, they begin to lose interest and they become less and less governmental as far as God is concerned until they finally drift away. And they've been replaced by another movie generation. Okay, now go with me to Romans chapter 10. And I think I want to start in, uh, I'm going to start in verse 9 because this is a very famous scripture that evangelical churches use to get people to say a prayer to go to heaven, taking it completely out of the context of which it was written. Because this, these scriptures here are based upon the first 10 chapters of Romans. Actually, it's based on the whole Bible, but... They lift it out of context and make it about heaven, when if you read the first ten chapters of Romans, it's talking about getting victory over sin. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now what does it mean, believe from the heart? It means that you believe what Paul has written in the first ten chapters where it says things like, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Where it says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Where it talks about the the carnal mind is death, but those that are spiritually minded are life and peace. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and I like that, because there we go again. You know, everything I minister here, there, there is so much out there that kills God's present work in people's lives. How many of you have heard that when you got born again, you got, you got Jesus' righteousness? That, you, you, that there's nothing you can do, you've already got His righteousness. But it says right here, the heart believes unto righteousness. Well, if I got it, then why do I have to believe unto something? If I've got it, why did Jesus tell me to seek His righteousness? If I got justification, why do I have to seek His justification? The Scripture says that. We read it. We've read it before. If I have the mind of Christ, why do I have to be transformed? Why does my mind have to be transformed? If I'm saved by grace, why does Paul write in in Titus, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, and yes to godliness. 
So I'm supposed to be being taught something by grace and being obedient to it. Then I'm saved by grace. I'm supposed to seek His righteousness. Then I get His righteousness. I'm supposed to seek His justification. Then I get His justification. But it's a joint effort. I'm not trying to seek it on my own. It's a joint venture with Him and me together. It's always been that way. God always wants to work with His people. And it's a joint venture to get these things. We're going to co-labor together, as the Scripture says. So it's not my righteousness I'm looking for. I'm not trying to get it on my own or my justification or being saved by grace. But I've been told many times, hey, you're saved by grace. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But then Paul writes what grace really is. It's something that's supposed to be teaching us something. So he says, let us believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we turn that into a heaven Scripture. But Paul is writing, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, where sin is trying to take dominion over you, when you call upon Him, He'll save you. You'll start co-laboring together with Him, and He will start to remove that. How many of you have had sins removed from you? How many of you had things that were in your life, and sometimes you didn't even have to ask? Sometimes you had things in your life that just fell off. But you had other things that you've had to work on. How many of you have had that? And you've worked on it, and you see sometimes you, you're free. Some of us are in the process of working on them, right? And you see them having less and less hold on you, right? What's happening is the increase of God's government is coming in your life. That thing that used to rule you, that used to set you off at any minute, or any time it happened, any time that type of a situation happened, now all of a sudden isn't having as strong as effect on you. What's happening? The increase of God's government is happening in your, in your life. And let me tell you something. Anytime God's increase comes in your life, something else has to decrease. And that's what's happening is that sin is starting to decrease in your life. And that's what we're fighting here for. You see, that's proof enough right there that we can walk without sin. If you've been set free of anything, I don't care what it is, God is not a partial God. God is not a God who does things halfway. If you've been set free of one thing, you can sit, bet, sit, be set free of two, three, four, five, until it's gone. Unless you're going to believe in a God that only goes half measures. Is that what you believe in? You look at the, the universe that's been created, you look at, we look at how, once in a while we get a little inkling of how big God is. Are you telling me He's too small to affect your life to where He can, if you, that if you'll let Him, He can set you free from sin? Come on. We've made him, we got a song, I think, that we've made you too small in our eyes. Isn't it? We have a song like that. Boy, you think? I don't think we can conceive how small we've made him. That's why these impossible stories are in the Bible. It's so that you and a guy can read about impossible things and know that most things are possible with God, right? Oh, it doesn't say all. All things are possible. And one day there will be a church that's mortal that will put on immortality. That's right. It's going to put on immortality. It says mortality puts on immortality. It doesn't say Jesus does it. It doesn't say Jesus comes down and puts mortality on immortality. It says that mortality puts on, in other words, it's putting something on, puts on immortality. And no, that's not when you go to heaven. Let's see, I was going to read a scripture about that. Where is that? Oh, yeah, it's in Hebrews. I'll go, I'll go to that after I read this. Finish this. Don't let me forget to go to Hebrews, okay? How, now, this is the interesting part that's in Romans, because remember, Jesus said, forgive them, for they not, not, know not what they do. They were Romans. So that opened the door for a Roman to go to Rome. And he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Uh, verse 14. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So I think it's interesting that Paul writes that particular scripture to the Romans. He's a Roman. And Jesus was saying, forgive those Romans, for they know not what they do. And that just shows me that it opened the door for, Jesus, for Paul to be the one to be called to go to the Romans, and he was the one that had to be sent. Interesting, isn't it? Should be. Because you never know when you're prophesying, when you're speaking. I mean, think about what I'm speaking up here today and the things that I've spoken or that you've spoken up here or that other people have spoken up here or, or what you've affected people on the outside, at your jobs or wherever you're at. You have no idea what you've loosed into people's lives. Listen, good or bad. But let's just hold with the good right now, okay? We'll talk about the bad some other time. Because we've seen the evidence of the bad, haven't we? We've seen what happens when children are called stupid, when they're called ugly, when they're called they'll never be any good. We've seen what happens during that prophecy. But when God moves upon you to prophesy something good, you have no idea how, what nation you're going to affect or what city or what group of people you're going to affect. We have a tendency to think that our words are just spoken into, into this little group here. But we are on the Internet. And... Which, by the way, is, is an interesting deal because now we have the ability to offend the whole world. <laughs> well, if without, without the, the Internet, without all of this technology, it'd just be you and me, the people that visit here, and maybe some people here around town, but nobody'd know it. Now we can offend the entire earth. We can offend every country on the earth. And we can give life to every country on the earth. And when I say we, I know it's God. Okay, don't get weird on me. Well, you're not doing it. Yes, it's the Lord. Everybody knows that. We have the ability, God has the ability through us now to give life to the whole world. So you want to talk about persecution? Like we did this morning? Now we can be persecuted by the whole world instead of just our own community and our own families. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we probably have. You know, I'm sure we get things written. Janet, do we get things written bad about us? Yeah. yeah. Do we have our lives threatened? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I kind of figured as much. Poor Janet, you probably have to read it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't see any of it because I, I don't look at the good or the bad. So you're just wasting your writing uh, because I don't look at any of it. What? She prays for him, too. So, Anyway. Okay, now turn with me to Hebrews. I didn't forget, did I? Oh, if I can find it. Uh, oh, man. I don't know if I can find it, folks. Well, here's a good one I want to read, though. <laughs> it goes along with what I'm saying. This is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15. It says, the Holy, okay. he says, The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, now listen to this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my what? Laws in where? Their hearts. And I will write them on where? Their minds. Listen. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. You see what comes first? So when you have somebody that's trying to get set free of certain things, when you see God's laws written on their hearts and written on their minds, now we can start maybe to, to maybe not watch them as close as we would have before those laws were written. Then you remember their lawless deeds no more. You don't forget about them while they're still doing the lawless deeds. You forget about them when God's laws have been written on their hearts. And I don't see how anybody, you can preach sin free off that scripture right there. How can you have God's laws written in your hearts and still sin? Or at least not believe in sin free. Okay, now I've got to find that other scripture which... 
which I probably can't find. What am I looking for? I'm looking for where it says in the children. Maybe it's in, oh, I'll bet I know where it is. Yep, here it is. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 14. Since the children have what? Flesh and blood. Okay, now let's stop right there for a minute. What is flesh and blood? What are you made of? What's, what's your, what's, what are the three things we have? Spirit, soul, and what? So what is flesh and blood? Is that spirit? Is it the soul? It's our body, right? So that sets the context, right? Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, which meant what? He, right, he had flesh and blood, thank you. So that by his death, what death? Spiritual death? Yeah, what? His body. That's the context. He didn't die soulishly, he didn't die spiritually. We're talking about his bodily death. He might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. So what death are we talking about? Who's, what power of death does the devil have? In this context. The, yeah, the death of our body. And it says that he might break the power of him who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now let's go to the famous scripture that charismatics just love to use. I give you what? Power over what? All the power of the enemy. Who said that? Jesus. It's not a trick question, folks. <laughs> Jesus said, I give you authority, or I give you power, over all the power of the enemy. What power did we just read that the devil has? That means we have power over it. According to the Scriptures. Now, we haven't experienced it yet, because we haven't made him Lord yet. People go and walk out, or people listen to us, and they, they say, well, those people out there believe they're never going to die. No, we believe there's going to be a generation that never dies. We believe there's going to be a generation, a church, who finally puts on immortality. And finally, that's why it says the last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. That's what the church is. In. What did the scripture say? It says, sit at my right hand till I what? Make your enemies your footstool. That's what God said to Jesus. Sit at my right hand. So unpack your bags because he ain't coming back tomorrow. Until the enemies are put under his feet and death is the last one. Why is death the last one? Because, because all the sins have to be dealt with and be freed of before death can be defeated. He's coming back for a bride perfect without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. The wages of sin is death. And we've, Paul wrote, sin no longer has dominion over us. Can we still sin? Yes, because we choose to but it doesn't have dominion over you. And there's going to be a generation who will not allow that dominion to take place in their life anymore. That's what we're fighting for here. We've got a long ways to go. We know that. We've still got a lot of sin in our lives. We've got a lot of Roman gods that still affect us. There's still people who are anxious, worried, in fear, angry, huh? lustful. We still have that. But at least we've seen the power of God. At least we've seen what God can do. And we're trying to move towards it. That's why the scripture says be changed. Not in an instant. It's from glory to glory. That's why it says be transformed. Not in a day, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That doesn't happen in a day. So people can believe that we're nuts. People can believe that we're crazy. They can believe we're a cult. And they're probably all right. Because we are nuts according to American culture. So we're trying to make, and that's what prophesying does. Prophesying is for edification. And what I've seen is that most prophesying I see done in America is for comfort and exhortation. It's not, it's not removing that which is inside of us so that more of God can move in. And I'm not just talking about morality. I'm not talking about beating people over their sins and trying to get them to stop it. 
I'm talking about there's a way, prophesying means that God's uh, attachment or voice is attached to it. And it gives it the ability, the power to expose what's in us, give us an excitement of what's in us, and not because of the sin that's in us, but the excitement is the fact that God can set us free from it. And somehow that voice gives us that knowledge, that hope that we can be set free of these things. And so that's why Paul says, I'd rather that you prophesy. Listen, I'm not against miracles. I'm not against words of wisdom or knowledge. I just think they're way overblown. And I think they take too much precedence in the church, and it's keeping people, hindering them, and keeping them where they're at because we're going after the wrong thing. Those are supposed to be the frosting on the cake. That's, yeah, that's supposed to be the sign that points to something greater. You know, I made this statement in a church out west and uh, kind of shocked him. I said, uh, you know, all those manifestations of the Holy Spirit, I said, they're not even a part of the kingdom of God. Boy, they looked at me, and so I heard somebody in the audience say, explain. And I said, Paul, does the, does the kingdom of God remain forever? All right, Paul writes, and he says about those manifestations, he says, when that which is perfect has come, that which is done in part will be done away with. Those signs and wonders are a mercy that God has given us that connects heaven with earth. They will work in this system. Do you know what I mean? By work, in other words, they'll work in our lives while we're not yet perfect. Divine health is only going to work in our life when we're perfect. But healing can work in us when we're not. And that's why he made, gave us those things. Because heaven is too perfect to operate in this system. So he made all of those things to operate just so you and I could have a sign that points to something else. You know, I've used this illustration before. If I go to Des Moines and tear the sign off, you, you, there's a sign, I think it used to be, I don't know if there is anymore, but I know when we go to Grand Junction, there's a sign there that, that says Grand Junction City Limit. And it gives you the population, you know, 19,000 something or other, elevation, I don't know, 560 some feet or something like that. Or, and if I tore that sign off and brought it back and propped it up here at the church and I said, look, I've got Grand Junction right here. You can call the guys in the white coats to carry me away. But yet that's what we do in church. We get a sign of something. We say the kingdom of God is here. No, the sign is there. You've still got to go a little bit further to get into the city. It's near you. You're near the kingdom of God. Just like when I go past that sign, I'm near Grand Junction, but I ain't in it. I've got to go a ways further to get to that city. And that city is far, far greater than the sign. Far greater. Any questions? Yeah. Um, in Hebrews? And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Let me read the whole thing. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Brenda, you've taught on that. What, what have you taught on that about? just that he died once for all so that the fear of death is what stops us from doing anything everything like and don't even just think physical death think death of a friendship death of a marriage death of a whatever you think just like you were talking earlier the minute you start serving god and you say i'm not going to do this anymore and what does the devil immediately do he starts sending people to talk to you and call you to put you in fear that your something in your life that you like is going to die you know and so it's Jesus paid that price one time for all so that we would no longer have to live in the fear of the bondage of death. It's bondage. Death. Think about it. Just stop and think for a minute. If, you, if death was no more, what would you be able to do in life? Would COVID be an issue if death was no more? What would, what, it would have no power over us, right, if death was no more. So the devil always uses death, bondage of death. When you say it that way, 
if death was was no fear, if death didn't exist, it'd be a lot easier to get free of sin. Because people sin because they're afraid they're going to die, and they and they want to live, eat, drink, and be merry while they're here on this earth. They're afraid anything, and that's one of the most difficult things it is to get people to come to God. Is they know immediately. We've had people come in this church and not be here 10 minutes, and they know they're going to have to die, and they'll leave. And when I say die, I'm not talking about physical death. They have to give their selfish, self-centered lifestyle up, and it's the fear of death that keeps them in that. And so he came to break that power. And uh, if we truly have all power over all the power of the enemy, then we got power over death because we just read that that's the devil's the one that has that power. No way to escape it. There's no way around it. Anybody else? Oh, boy. I got all kind of hands coming up. I just wanted just to reiterate, you know, that w- that religion says that God giveth and God taketh away. And we, we the religious part of it, God t- gives you a baby and he takes it away. But that isn't God's character and that's not what he does. But he will give us the Holy Spirit and take away the things out of our lives that are killing us. That's God is always redemptive. He never kills. He never uses death as an instrument to prove his majesty. He just never does it. And that's one thing that religion has overblown and and lied about so desperately is that God if you if you're still sinning, God's going to bonk you on the head or he's going to make you sick or he's going to take something from you to show you that he's God and you're not. And God is not like that. He wants to take the sin in our heart that's killing us and replace it with himself. So God giveth and God taketh away. That's what he meant. That's what was meant when he said that. And I, it just popped into my head when you were preaching. I just want to read these scriptures where you're talking about immortality. Mortality puts on immortality. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to start in verse 50. Brother, I tell you this, brethren, or but I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot become partakers of eternal salvation, inherit or share in the kingdom, nor does the perishable inherit or share in the imperishable. Take notice, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall be changed and transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet call. For a trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ, so that doesn't necessarily mean you're physically dead, the ones that have died to yourself because you're dead in Christ, will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay, and will be changed and transformed for this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature and this mortal part of us this nature that is capable of dying must put on immortality freedom from death and when the perishable puts on the imperishable and that was what that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death then shall be fulfilled the scripture that says death is swallowed up utterly vanquished forever in and unto victory O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? But it'll never come to pass if we don't change our present. If we don't allow God in to change our present life, it it, it will come to pass because the Bible says it will, but it won't come to pass in our lives. And think of how many people are sitting in church waiting for Jesus to come back and do all of that when he delivered it into our hands to do it. That's what he did. What do you think the greater works are? Didn't he say we do greater works than he did? What do you think that is? Anybody else?
In the beginning, you made a reference to the word plateau. And all too often in this world, I, I've seen too many people that have gone a ways and all of a sudden stop. It seems like where faith just seems to be coming to an end, that they think they have done enough, that they've achieved the goal. They're saved. Well, I think most of us know the truth of that, and that is that if we plateau, if we stop building, if we stop growing, if we stop reading, if we stop any of that, you know, the devil's going to catch up. And then he's going to take over because we've stopped. The God that we serve wants us to always be growing. And as long as we do that, we will achieve the goal that we seek. You know, it's interesting you bring uh, Plateau because Kathy and I, we spend our vacation on a uh, place called the Uncompagre Plateau. And it's kind of a flat mountain is what it is. It goes up so high and then it just it's just level <clears throat> on top. Very friendly, very comfortable to be there. Very uh, pleasing to the eyes. But when you go into the main mountain range, you, you know, the Rocky Mountains, the big rock, it's scary. It looks unfriendly. And you think it can kill you in a minute. You don't feel that way on the plateau, but you feel that way in the main range. And look, I'm an outdoorsman. And the first time I went to hunting there is I went up, I drove up in the dark. And it got light on me when I was up there in those rocky, I'm talking 14,000 foot peaks. And I didn't feel, I, I've, I, I, I hate, it's, it's hard to describe, folks. It's hard to describe. It's not like I'm terrified and I'm shaking. But it's like you feel very insignificant and very, like these things, it, it, these things can kill you real quick. I don't feel that way on the plateau. And that's what people do is they plateau out and they stay there because it's comfortable and it's friendly and it's pleasing to the eyes. But you get in where you're going to have to climb up higher and where there's, listen, where nobody's possibly been before and there's no other life up there. It's just rock, no path to follow, it gets scary. I got used to it after about three days. Yeah, it's hard to breathe. I got used to it after about three or four days. It, it, it didn't bother me like it did. And I don't really want to use the word even bother. It was just a, yeah, yeah, kind of an odd, creepy, uneasy. That would probably be about the best way to describe it. Very uneasy feeling. And, uh, but you get used to it after a while. But it was amazing to me because I've always been an outdoorsman. I've always loved the mountains. And it just surprised me that I had that feeling you know, uh, when I got up in there. And uh, then when I saw some of the roads I drove up on, it was dark and you couldn't see. And it's probably a good thing I might have turned around and gone back. And I always hated that drive up there because it was, there was places it wasn't very good. So anyway, keep that in mind when we talk about plateau. And that's what a lot of people do in church is we plateau out where we're comfortable. And that's where we stay all our life. And there's to be an increase. We have to fight for the increase, folks, because the devil is increasing, and you're not having to fight for that. You have to fight against it, but you're not fighting for that. You know, a lot of people fight against things, but we're not fighting for something. you got a lot of churches fighting against what's going on in the, in the United States today, but they're not fighting for anything. You know what I mean? They're not fighting for God. They're fighting against abortion or against the gay or against all of these different things. And that's fine, but we ought to be fighting for something as well, his kingdom. You say, well, he's already given it to us. Then how come we ain't walking in it? It's we're fighting to get ourselves in line with what he's already provided. Amen? Anybody else? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Again, give understanding. The Holy Spirit, he's the comforter, the guide. 
that leads us, the teacher that leads us into all truth. And Father, we just thank you so much that when we come here, we can be exhorted, we can be comforted, but we want to be prophesied to. We want to be edified. We want those things that are in your temple to be removed by you, the good king, to be cut down. And Father, we just thank you so much that you've taken us this far, but this far is nothing compared to where you want to take us. It's not enough. And so, God, we want to sing prophecy. We want to preach prophecy and pray it. And we thank you, Lord. Make us fighters for your kingdom. And we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.